Welcome to Thought in Motion, the seminars of Jacques Lacan. Today we're covering content found in Lecture 11 entitled Ego Ideal and Ideal Ego, found in Seminar 1. In this video, I will 1. Clarify the optical schema, 2. Discuss the differences between the ideal ego, ego ideal, and superego, and 3. Address the problem of love as it pertains to the ideal ego and ego ideal. If you enjoy this video, please like it and consider subscribing to my channel. In Lecture 11, Lacan returns to the optical schema. This model shouldn't be taken literally. It offers a metaphor for thinking of the relationships between the symbolic, imaginary, and real. We first will focus on the plane mirror, which Lacan this time likens to a pane of glass. This changes the nature of what we're seeing. When going window shopping, for example, what does one see? We do see real objects, in this case the merchandise, as well as the reflection of ourselves and the background in the window pane. The real objects in a scene coincide with the reflected images. What does the mirror or window pane represent? It's not exactly clear to me from this lecture alone. If the mirror represents the activity of mirroring, then it would suggest that it stands for one's parents, perhaps, and more broadly the symbolic other who mediates my relationship to the real and structures the imaginary. It's not clear this other is meant to represent the mirror itself or the one who positions the mirror. What is made clear is that the inclination of the mirror is governed by the symbolic. This suggests that depending upon its positioning, the subject can have varying levels of integrated or disintegrated experiences of themselves and their world. Next, you may notice that I have put an X over the imaginary and real image labels. I believe I made an error in the last video, mixing up the real image with the virtual one in my presentation on the optical schema. I interpreted the flowers in the vase on the right side as the real image because given its location behind the plane mirror, it would be invisible to the eye on the left side. In contrast, I labeled the area in front of the mirror as the virtual image since that is what the eyes would see. However, it turns out that the flowers and vase on the right are intended to represent what the eye is seeing, whereas the real image is indeed invisible to the eye, but also not visually depicted in this diagram, so it's invisible to our eyes as well. Understanding the plane mirror as a window pane and turning to examples of real and virtual images in the field of optics helped clarify this for me. We can see here how the real object is reflected off the window pane at the same same time, the window pane allows light in from another real object that is behind it. The two objects come together to form a virtual image for the observer. While this leaves out the concave mirror and thus we don't have a real image created as well, this example hopefully serves its purpose of clarifying Lacan's optical schema. So let us then ask what these images represent. Again, it's not clear here what the real image represents. It is reflected off the concave mirror, but is never seen. I do wonder if the real image may represent what Lacan will call in later seminars the thing, das Ding. I say this because the thing also never appears. Rather, it is the lost object that is the engine for desire. And to extend this interpretation a little further, if we say that the virtual image represents the illusion of bodily unity, may the real image represent the mother's body, forever lost to us and yet forever in search of it? I keep this open as a hypothesis and perhaps we can test it together as we proceed through these seminars. The meaning of the virtual image is clearer as already mentioned, it represents the imaginary unity of the body. It also represents the ideal ego. The ideal ego is that image we form of ourselves as whole, integrated, and perfect in all ways. It functions as a narcissistic captation. The term captation is a neologism that means both to captivate and to capture. The ideal ego presents a specular image that bedazzles and ensnares us in the world of fantasy. Lacan notes that something similar happens with animals in their mating rituals whereby they are captivated by a particular image expressed by the other sex, seducing the animal to copulate. Yet at the same time, an animal can be tricked into this instinctual ritual by being presented with a lure or imitation that leads the animal to displace its captation onto another object. Humans, in contrast, seem to have this captation be defined by this activity of displacement 
replacement. In other words, we might say, in humans, il n'y a pas de rapport sexuel. There is no such thing as a sexual relationship. While we won't unpack this famous formula by Lacan here, I'd like to at least suggest that the captation in humans that is fundamentally narcissistic, and so, as such, sexual relations, which require another, a partner, ultimately become masturbatory in nature. And perhaps for this reason, there can be no sexual relationship, as love is always located in the imaginary. We may also consider whether uh, this links up with the concept of a polymorphous perversity, which is in fact normative for humans. Again, these are just some speculations on my part, and we'll test these hypotheses as we proceed through the seminars. We now move on to a new addition to the model provided in Lecture 11. We see here a VS added in the upper right corner, standing for the virtual subject. According to Lacan, the virtual subject is where we first see our ego in human form outside of us. The position of the subject, like the original subject on the left, is determined by the symbolic. He calls it a reflection of the mythical eye, that is to say, the other which we are. It is also linked to the primitive impotence of the human being. That impotence seems to derive from the fact that we can only see ourselves from the outside as a mirage. Lacan then adds that Freud does not address the virtual subject in the essay on narcissism, which is being dis analyzed in this particular lecture. So not much more is said of it here. The virtual subject will eventually come to be identified with the ego ideal. Whereas the ideal ego operates at the level of the imaginary, the ego ideal operates at the level of the symbolic. It governs the position of the subject and is responsible for the structuration of the imaginary. The ideal ego emerges from the mirror stage, whereby the nascent ego is captivated by and identifies with an image of itself. The ego ideal appears at the resolution of the Oedipus complex and is introjected through a secondary identification. Finally, Finally, the ideal ego is captivated and captured by specular objects, which are created in part through a process of projection. In contrast, the ego ideal expresses itself through symbolic relations, including speech, signifiers, and the law, and encourages the redirecting of libidinal energies through the process of sublimation. This leaves open questions concerning a more familiar kind of ego, the superego, and its relationship to the ego ideal. While often presented as synonymous, they are, in fact, playing different roles. Lacan discusses some of this in Lecture 11. Like the ego ideal, it functions within the symbolic register, emerges upon resolution of the Oedipus complex, and has a relationship with the law. Where they begin to differ is in their functions. The superego seeks the narcissistic satisfaction of the ego ideal and keeps watch over the actual ego. It operates like a censor, and so rather than encouraging sublimation encourages instead repression. Yet it is with the law that we find the greatest divergences between the two, perhaps to the point of there being conflict among them. Just briefly to define the law, it is that in the symbolic which structures human relationships and, and speech and is often expressed in society uh, in the form of prohibitions. Now, whereas the ego ideal functions within the law, the superego seems to misrecognize the law and so becomes a law unto itself. This would account for the, at times, sadistic and masochistic quality of its activity. Lacan ends this lecture talking about love, which he identifies with infatuation. Love for Lacan operates at the level of the imaginary. It seeks the imaginary perfection and unity of the ideal ego, not unlike what is portrayed by the character Aristophanes in Plato's book entitled The Symposium, in which he tells of an original androgynous being that we are seeking to become again through love. What is notable for us here is that its occurrence is catastrophic for the ego ideal. Lacan states that love is when the ego ideal meets the ideal image in the world of objects. The consequence of this is a kind of descent into madness, as anyone who has experienced the intense feelings of infatuation may be able to attest to. Now, we're left with a question. Given the previous equating of transference and love, how is this understanding of love related to the activity of transference in the analytic relationship? Lacan admits that there are some differences, and we'll go on to develop this later. Thank you for watching. Please feel free to provide comments and questions down below, and I'll see you next time.